Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our preview of the top priorities CBF's Virginia office will be tackling during this year's General Assembly session, which will kick off tomorrow. I'm Gabby Troutman, uh, the Virginia Grassroots Manager, and I'm really thrilled to have you all here tonight. Before we dive into the content, I wanna make sure everybody's comfortable with Zoom and highlight the Q&A feature. As Jay goes through his slides, you can feel free to submit any questions you might have and we'll answer them at the end of the presentation. You can find the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window. There will be a Q&A button along that toolbar. If you click on it, you can open the window, type your question and submit it. You can also upvote questions. So if you see a question that you're particularly interested in, you can upvote that and it'll help us prioritize questions that everyone would like answered. And please reserve the chat function for any technical issues that you need to communicate to us. I'm happy to have Jay Ford here tonight. He's our Virginia Policy and Grassroots Advisor. Jay primarily focuses on Eastern Shore issues and works with CBF staff throughout the Commonwealth on policy and grassroots activities that help to save the Bay. He also spends a considerable amount of time advocating for water quality issues at the Virginia General Assembly and works with state regulatory agencies to implement environmental protections. Before joining CBF, he served as the Virginia Eastern Shorekeeper, and he was a legislative aide and campaign advisor to Lieutenant Governor Ralph Northam. I'm turning it over to you, Jay. Thanks so much, and good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us on a, a beautiful, beautiful night around the Commonwealth to talk about my favorite topic, which is the General Assembly. Um, a lot of things have changed since the last time the General Assembly met. And so tonight we're gonna briefly talk about what the um, new makeup means for legislation and um, anticipated outcomes. Then we are going to do a dive into the legislative priorities that CBF will be directly working on. Um, and then towards the end, we will carve out some time to answer any questions you might have about these bills or areas that I did not touch on this evening, but you're interested in learning more about. So the first thing, we had an election last fall after uh, redistricting, and that means we have two new leaders, one in the House and one in the Senate. We have Speaker-elect Don Scott, who will be Speaker Don Scott tomorrow when the uh, House of Delegates convenes, and we have Majority Leader Surreville, who is going to lead the uh, Democrats in the majority in the Senate. So two new leaders, uh, new approaches and uh, priorities. And so that shapes a lot of the priorities in um, water quality legislation as these two men will have a lot of impact on what bills move forward and what bills make their way to the dustbin this year. And so a lot of attention will be paid um, to their priorities as we try to navigate this new General Assembly. In addition to new leadership, there are scores of new faces. Um, significant turnover in the Senate and uh, significant turnover in the House means that there are many, many, many new members. Um, many are likely some of your legislators who have never uh, been in the General Assembly before. So, they are going to be drinking from a fire hose this year. They're gonna be learning uh, not only how to submit their first bills and walk them through committees and get them to the floor, hopefully for a vote and passage, um, and, but they're gonna to have to do this while balancing all of the thousands of constituents that will come through the building and folks like myself that are there to advocate for bills. So um, on their behalf, I urge you all to be patient with your new members, but also take the time to let them know that if you care about these issues, that you can be a resource and you wanna help them because they are certainly gonna be looking for helpers in the coming weeks as they go through their very first session. So the budget, uh, we kind of live and die by the budget. At the end of the day, if it is not, if something is not in the budget, it is not really, a uh, a reality it is ephemeral so getting your clean water priorities into the budget is one of our top priorities each year um, we have some bins which we call these major budget requests that come up uh, with 
regularity. Um, usually they're in each budget cycle. Sometimes we've been lucky enough to have funds that carry over throughout the biennium. But by and large, when we think about what are the major sectors of clean water, we're talking about agriculture, we're talking about wastewater, stormwater, and increasingly what we refer to as the climate change bin or climate uh, resilience and adaptation. And so these bins really represent um, a significant portion of the clean water funds that Virginia commits to this work and bay restoration each year. We're gonna spend a little bit of time on the um, particulars of each of these funds, but you can see uh, heading into this general assembly session, we are um, looking for close to $700 million in just the bins that are reflected on the screen. Once you start looking at some of the um, smaller asks, as well as uh, complementary natural resource items uh, to help protect the resources in Virginia, we're looking at close to a billion dollars. So um, it is not an insignificant amount of money. It is, it is a huge uh, workload each year. And luckily, each of these sectors have skilled advocates that we work hand in hand with to get these items across the finish line. So the first, Virginia's Agricultural Cost Share Program, also known as VACS, or many of you um, may know it as Agricultural Best Management Practices. And this is, these are funds that the state provides to soil and water districts all around the Commonwealth to, um, so they can work directly with farmers to get clean water practices on the ground. And that is everything from making sure you plant your cover crops uh, in the winter to hold the soil in place to putting up stream uh, fences or buffers to keep cattle out of the streams um, or to some more innovative things that um, have popped up recently like mobile water units. So there's uh, there are literally scores of different practices that can be implemented on farms and making sure that the uh, cost share program is fully funded is really a top priority for us this year. We are happy to say that the governor did commit significant funds, um, over $200 million to Virginia's agricultural cost share program this year. We, um, we are gonna be asking for a slight change to the budget language this session, but all in all, we're very grateful for the governor's commitment and we're hopeful that the members of the House and Senate will uh, hold on to those big figures so we can get this money deployed and out to Virginia's farmers. Next is the Stormwater Local Assistance Fund. This is uh, absolutely critical to helping our um, urban environments deal with stormwater issues. The program uh, helps them capture and deal with stormwater in a way that measures, uh, that quantifies the reductions in uh, nutrient and sediment. So it's good for us and our purposes at the Bay. And it's good for those localities because water on the streets um, is an absolute menace as many of you are probably aware of. The, the Stormwater Local Assistance Fund or SLAP unfortunately was zeroed out in the governor's introduced budget. So we are starting with nothing, but we have identified patrons on both the House and the Senate side who will be introducing budget amendments this year to help us get that number back to where it should be. So we'll be asking for $50 million to the Stormwater Local Assistance Fund this year. The next bin is our wastewater treatment plant upgrades. Um, Again, unfortunately, this was an item that did not make its way into the governor's introduced budget. So uh, we are starting at zero. Again, we are working with our friends in the wastewater sector, as well as members in the House and Senate to try and address this budget shortfall. Uh, wastewater has been one of the most successful sectors in many ways because it is the easiest to quantify. With the wastewater, you have a pipe, you measure what's coming out of the pipe, you make sure that what's coming out of the pipe is uh, contains less pollution. Um, because of sort of, I won't say the ease, because it's very technical, but 
um, the ease of tracking and the um, sole source of wastewater, it has been extremely effective and they have made ex uh, significant strides in meeting their bay restoration target. So we do not want to take our foot off the gas. So we will be uh, looking for $200 million this year to allow the wastewater facilities around the Commonwealth to continue their work um, upgrading those facilities and continuing to reduce their nutrients into the bay. Combined sewer overflows or CSOs. If you live in Richmond or Alexandria or Lynchburg, you have almost certainly heard of this. Um, these are remnants in many ways of how our cities were built out previously. And so historic areas, um, are, are prone to have this kind of infrastructure. And this is where your stormwater and your sewage um, can, can become combined in heavy rain events, resulting in raw sewage making its way into bodies of water. The, um, the problem is well documented. The General Assembly has taken action in past sessions to direct the, um, that these systems are addressed and so both Lynchburg and Alexandria have really made tremendous strides in um, the last couple of years. Alexandria is very close to uh, complete. We are expecting legislation this year that would uh, give them an additional year to uh, complete the work, but they've made tremendous strides and so we're supportive of that action. The city of Richmond in the governor's budget was provided $50 million to uh, advance their work on the combined sewer overflows. Um, we we uh, welcome that funding from the governor's budget. We understand there will be additional amendments around this issue. The city of Richmond is facing um, a, a need of $400 million that they hope will be able to come from the state of Virginia in the coming years in order to meet um, their requirements to address the CSO work. So there will be um, legislation or budget amendments during this session and, and likely sessions to come. Oysters. We're very excited this year to see that the governor did include additional uh, money in his budget. And uh, this is a result of a settlement from the attorney general's office, but there is an additional $2 million net in the uh, oyster replenishment budget. This is uh, money that is used to get uh, oyster shell back out on our um, working reefs around the Commonwealth. So it has an economic development benefit as well as a water quality benefit. All of these uh, oysters are out there making baby oysters. So we, we love to see it. We're excited to support those new numbers. Um, Additionally, last year, many of you may remember, but uh, CBF worked on a oyster shell recycling bill. And this piece of legislation allowed the Virginia Marine Resource Commission to stand up a grant program that would incentivize businesses and organizations to help recycle shell, make sure it gets back out into the water. Um, shell is the best substrate. Um, and so making sure that we're, we're capturing this valuable resource is um, critical. It's why we pushed that legislation. We were successful in getting it passed last year. This year, we'd like to put some money in it. So we will be working on a budget amendment of $150,000 to uh, capitalize that fund and hopefully start uh, bringing new restaurants and businesses around the Commonwealth into the oyster shell recycling programs. mussels, the freshwater companion to oysters. Additionally, or similarly, they're doing wonderful work helping filter the waters around the state, um, in, particularly in our freshwater streams and, and uh, bodies of water. Mussels are unfortunately in trouble. Um, I think one of the more disturbing pieces of news I saw at the end of the year was the list of species that went extinct. Um, Unfortunately, six of them were mussels um, types or species in the United States, one of which found in Virginia. So mussels are um, in, in many ways threatened. 
But here in Virginia, we've taken tremendous strides in the last couple of years to try and address that issue by uh, making investments in freshwater mussel hatcheries, as well as creating two positions at the Department of Wildlife Resources who are dedicated to um, wor working to build up our freshwater mussels um, and get them deployed into bodies of water around the Commonwealth. So we will, um, we were happy to see that the governor also put $2 million towards mussel work in the budget, again, um, utilizing funds from a uh, legal settlement. Trees. So every um, year, probably for the last five years, you, you have heard one of us talk about trees. Many of you have worked closely, I'm sure, with Ann Jerzyk, uh on tree canopy. This is going to be the year. Um, if for no other reason, I believe there's something like 15 tree bills. So odds are really on our side that there will be some movement. There's going to be a number of uh, different vehicles. One will look at the impacts from VDOT projects and um, potential solutions or um, arrangements for them to expand tree canopy on the lands that they hold. Um, another will look at giving localities around the state additional authorities to retain uh, tree canopy in the development process making sure that localities can, if they make the decision that they need, want, need more trees in their locality, that they have the tools and the right to do so, which currently um, there are restrictions uh, in state law that prevent them from um, making some of these canopy changes. And well, the picture we have here, you can probably see this kind of faint uh, outline and um, I want to thank Anne for grabbing these images because this really does a wonderful job of highlighting the issue. Um, we talk when we talk about trees, it's one of those things that many people feel like we must have solved because everyone's recognized for a long time that deforestation is a problem. But um, Virginia is still continuing to lose tree canopy year after year. Um, despite, you know, the abundance of evidence of all of the, the many benefits of trees on everything from clean water, of course, to um, helping cool communities, to dealing with flood and uh, climate impacts, um, or just dealing, improving quality of life. And yet we're still going the wrong direction. And so we're hopeful that legislation this year will help solve it. I want to show you that same neighborhood um, afterwards and we can get a sense of how impactful development really has been here. So you can see that the roads uh, that were overlaid here and this is that same development on the other side. The ability to require a higher canopy, um, re to, to require more tree cover long term for a locality or to negotiate with builders on the existing trees that are there. Those are our key, key tools in your locality's toolbox that, that are currently are not available to them. So legislation this year um, will help tackle that issue and uh, give the localities more tools in their toolbox to help us um, start to turn around this deforestation trend that we continue to see in Virginia. Um, and I also want to note there is one comprehensive tree bill that we're working with Delegate Patrick Pope on, which will do a statewide analysis of tree canopy, um, identify priority corridors and um, recommendations for preserving canopy moving forward. And that'll be known as the Forest Conservation Act. The mighty Menhaden. Um, it's not a general assembly session unless there is something on Manhattan. So this year, many of you may remember that last year there was legislation to um, study the Chesapeake Bay specific impacts of the reduction fishery on the Manhattan population and Manhattan's role in the broader ecosystem. Unfortunately, that bill um, was amended. And so the bill became a study to do a study, um, which was frustrating, but it was a way to advance the bill and, and make some progress. 
So this year we have the report back from the, the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. It is a detailed multi-year study on um, Menhaden specific to the Chesapeake Bay. Um, this is going to cost about $2.7 million and take three years. So we will be working on both the budget amendment to fund this study, as well as a piece of legislation with Delegate Lee Ware that um, specifically directs the study. We are very excited about this. One of our partner organizations has been working on this uh, issue. This is the um, homeowner associations and um, the potential for blocking um, native plants or conservation landscaping. Many of you may have seen this in the news where there are um, HOAs that um, require a certain turf, graph, turf, turf grass or um, other planting re requirements. And a lot of homeowners increasingly are interested in planting natives. They're interested in having pollinator gardens or um, planting things that can help hold on to the storm water um, or, or really just have a, a more varied and beautiful yard utilizing some of the plants that um, the flora and fauna of Virginia depend upon. Um, their HOAs have currently have the authority to restrict that kind of planting. There is legislation from Delegate Krizik this year that would uh, look to new agreements in HOAs and provide some lenience towards what is being coined as conservation landscaping. Um, the HOAs would still have some ability to look at aesthetic considerations, but they would not be able to just have a, um, a blanket ban on planting natives or planting these these conservation landscaping um, setups. We think this is a, a, a really truly important bill. And, and let me highlight why. Um, in Virginia, as of this year, uh, over 40% of all new development is in an HOA. So when we talk about something that will truly impact a lot of uh, the Commonwealth, this piece of legislation could have a tremendous impact. And so you will almost certainly hear about this in the coming weeks. This is going to be, um, I, I'm sure, a robust conversation. And the legislation may take some twists and turns, but we're really excited about it and grateful to our partners at Nature Forward for um, helping get this bill into a posture that can move forward this session. The toxic pavement sealant prohibition. This is another oldie, but a goodie. We have worked on this uh, many years um, through different sponsors. Um, toxic sealants, they contain uh, high levels of what are known as PAHs or polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Um, these can be harmful to humans and wildlife. The sealants that are oftentimes used on asphalt uh, contain a, over a thousand times more PAHs than similar um, products that do the exact same thing. Um, the impacts uh, and health concerns have been well documented. And so we are working with Delegate Tran on a statewide piece of legislation that would allow localities um, or, or a statewide ban on um, these sealants, this General Assembly session. Um, the important things to note here are that this is a product that has a, um, an analog without the toxins that is the exact same price and just as easy to find. So this in many ways is a common sense bill to just move away from the bill that or the product that represents uh, potential harm to the Commonwealth. Resilience and climate adaptation. Um, this is going to be a huge, huge topic this year. There will be um, many bills that are dealing with the issue of climate impacts on the Commonwealth. Today is a pretty perfect backdrop. We have record levels of flooding in parts of Virginia. Um, the, the weather has shut down schools from the Eastern Shore to Hampton Roads. Um, and this, unfortunately, is going to continually 
become a more persistent um, condition as uh, weather patterns continue to shift and our persistent sea level rise uh, continues to increase as well. So the Commonwealth will be tackling, coming at climate adaptation from a couple of different ways this year. The first uh, area that we'll be working in is unfortunately on, G on December 31st, Virginia exited the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, also known as REGI. Um, we will be working with our partners to um, introduce budget language to re reinsert Virginia into REGI as soon as possible. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that our departure from REGI punches a massive hole in both energy efficiency and flood and um, adaptation work in the Commonwealth. REGI funds represent the only true uh, climate resilience funds that Virginia has. Our Community Flood Preparedness Fund has been solely um, funded by proceeds from the REGI auction. So um, getting us back into REGI is gonna be a top priority for us this year. Additionally, you saw earlier in the presentation, the Community Flood Preparedness Fund, we, we are asking that given that the um, governor and the administration took steps to remove us from REGI, um, that they, they certainly need to make sure that the final budget includes funds that um, backfill for the Community Flood, Flood Preparedness Fund. So communities that have done the work of preparing plans to um, to start the start down the path of climate adaptation will not be left in the lurch and will be able to move forward with those projects that they uh, planned through their um, grant process. So uh, the governor did include $100 million. Um, we, we are looking for them to put similar amount of money in year two of the budget, and um, we'll be working with members on budget amendments for that. Also this year, um, there's gonna be legislation from the administration that we are working closely on to create a office of the chief resilience officer. This would be a office with, um, within the governor's uh, shop that helps quarterback climate change resilience activities across all of the secretariats and agencies to make sure that we're taking an all of government approach and that we're not doing something um, in one area that is harmful to our purposes elsewhere. Clean water is a really good example. Virginia has a stated preference of using nature-based design. Um, it's cost-effective, and it also means that when um, we help protect our communities from flooding, we're also help, helping protect our water from potential pollution by utilizing nature-based design. So one of the things we hope this office will be focusing on is ways to maximize the co-benefits between um, bay cleanup and climate adaptation work here in the Commonwealth. Additionally, there will be legislation we're working on to increase transparency on the Community Flood Preparedness Fund, as well as a, the Virginia Revolving Loan Fund, which is a loan program for businesses and individual homeowners. Um, and finally, we will be working on a flood risk disclosure bill as well with a number of partners. Um, we have homes around Virginia that are um, more and more continually underwater. And this legislation would help make sure that the homeowners were not underwater figuratively as well as financially. Uh, because they did not know that the property they moved into was prone to such flooding. Uh, wetlands has been a very hot topic ever since the Sackett decision earlier this year. Um, we will be working to make sure that uh, any legislation that would degrade Virginia's robust uh, wetlands protection laws is defeated. Additionally, um, there is likely to be legislation this year that um, seeks to put holes in our living shoreline guidance from 2020. Um, we'll be working with the sponsors on that to make sure it does not impact Virginia's commitment to living shorelines as our um, preferred shoreline treatment. And then finally, um, in, in wetlands, there 
Virginia faces uh, a huge, huge challenge with climate impacts in that we don't really have a plan for how our wetlands will migrate in the coming years. Uh, Virginia's Coastal Resilience Master Plan projects that by 2080, we could lose upwards of 80% of our tidal wetlands and that we could lose in excess of 50% of our non-tidal wetlands. Um, all of this is largely driven by climate impacts, both uh, sea level rise, uh, shifting drought patterns and, and rainfall patterns. Um, and these wetlands are one of our key, key ecosystems for bay health, for habitat, um, as well as buffers in the face of increasing climate impacts. So coming up with a roadmap to help us uh, avert and, and possibly enhance um, wetlands and avoid that horrifying loss that we're looking at by 2080 is a top priority. And so we're working with Delegate Simons to develop Virginia's first comprehensive roadmap on wetlands protection in the face of climate impacts. We are also very excited to be working on two areas of um, environmental education. The first is the creation of Virginia's Environmental Literacy Fund. Um, as you all may know, CBF, we get to take a ton of kids out on the water. It is always an absolute blast. We have uh, the, always some of the most fun in my year is when we get a chance to be with a student out on the water and um, for some of which it's their very first opportunity to experience the Chesapeake Bay. It is always transformational, but it is usually just one day. And the rest of the year, they're gonna be back in their school system. And so the thinking with the Environmental Literacy Fund is we need to uh, provide resources for the educators that are going to be with them the rest of the year. So uh, the Environmental Literacy Fund would be eligible uh, school districts will be able to develop their own environmental literacy plan using these funds. Additionally, resources could go to educators so they can um, become trained in environmental education and carry that back into the classroom. Um, on top of that, Virginia does have an environmental education fund for, um, for meaningful watershed experiences or MEWIs. Um, that fund is currently at $250,000, which sounds like a lot, but it is actually rather small, particularly when we look at what other states are doing to make sure kids have these outdoor experiences. Uh, some of our neighboring states are 2 million or 2.5 million. So we are working with members of the General Assembly to introduce budget amendments to start Virginia on a path over um, the next couple of budget cycles to start to grow the size of our environmental education fund so we can get more students around the Commonwealth out on the water. Okay, that was a blisteringly uh, fast and probably recklessly fast overview of a lot of our key priority items, but uh, almost without a doubt, we will find many more bills that we adopt in the coming weeks. Um, we've spent a lot of time in the last days uh, reviewing all of the legislation that has gone in. Members, as we speak, are hitting um, send, to send um, to introduce additional legislation. So as we um, get through the end of this week, there will be other items that come on. Um, we've already started to look at bills in environmental justice, um, legislation that explores stormwater exemptions, uh, legislation to support native plants, or to specifically ban the sale of extremely invasive plants. And there will likely be bills dealing with conflicts in solar development. Um, all of this is to say is that there will, you will likely hear about many more things from us throughout this session. So don't be surprised if it was not included in this presentation today. And now that we've given you a huge brain dump on uh, what our legislative priorities are going to be, did just wanna give a couple of pointers because our hope is that you all are gonna take the opportunity to go talk to legislators. So 
The very first thing is, again, there's so many new members. Shoot them an email and introduce yourself and how you fit into their district and the community. Um, one of the most important things you can do is make sure your legislator knows you as a person and not just you as an individual that sends them um, demanding letters during general assembly session or that shows up at their office. Um, they Legislators are people too, and they respond to folks that they have a relationship with. So um, make sure that you take the time to really introduce yourself and not um, only visit them during general assembly. Uh, another thing that's important to know, a well-informed constituent always trumps a lobbyist. I go to talk to members. Um, I can bring them all the fact sheets in the world. I can bring them my, my nifty draft that I spent all night uh, thinking about. And if there is a well-informed member of the public that lives in their district, that person is always more important to me than, than I am. And that is is so, so important that legislators really take the idea seriously that they represent their constituents. And so the most effective voice is always going to be someone has done their research and goes to talk to their member. So it is a way you can be uh, very effective is taking the time to become knowledgeable, um, work, you know, we're happy to provide expertise or point you to the right groups if you want to make yourself knowledgeable, but um, a constituent is, always the person they want to hear from. And then finally, we really, uh, Gabby, I suspect is going to talk a little bit more about this, but we'd love for you to come visit during session. It's, it's very important, but more important is that you go visit them after session too. Um, do not, uh, you do not want them to just see you as one of a thousand faces that comes by the gen during the general assembly session. They your relationship with them, your ability to uh, help shape their legislative agenda will be so much more impactful if they get to know you in the district and um, as a constituent. So can't stress that enough. I know um, we're going to go to questions now. So I'm going to let Gabby take over because she knows where we're headed next. Thanks, Jay. And also, commercial break before we hit the Q&A. Thank you for mentioning coming to lobby with us during session. We will actually be hosting a water lobby day on Tuesday, January 30th. You can come to Richmond and visit your legislators. We'll have a welcoming in the morning. Um, we'll guide you in the right direction to find your meetings. You'll be able to meet with other constituents from your district. And I have put the registration link for that in the chat. And if you've never lobbied before, we try to make it as simple as possible uh, so that you can feel confident and comfortable going into those meetings. The week beforehand, we'll host a uh, Zoom meeting just like this for you to be able to hear about the bills that we are addressing at that time and that are moving forward so that you can have all of the information. We'll go over the logistics of how the day will run, everything you need to know from where to park, what to wear, how, you should have those conversations with legislators and it's a really great time and it's especially a great day if you bring along a friend or neighbor who is interested in these topics it's really great to have as many people as possible there to show that there are support for these issues so i encourage you to register for water lobby day and join us and i will now switch gears to the q and a uh, the first question, Jay, says that there is a trend to convert farmland to solar farms and data centers, both of which can affect stormwater runoff, causing sediment and nutrients to run into our tributaries and the bay. Does CBF have any legislative initiatives to help control those issues? CBF um, worked closely on a piece of legislation last year known as HB 206 from Delegate Weber. Um, this legislation looked specifically at that conflict of um, solar with the issue of cutting down trees and use, utilizing prime ag um, farmland to put solar farms up. Uh, obviously, we, we're concerned. Um, our, you know, it's tough because this is two goods. We're excited that Virginia is 
making so much progress in reducing emissions and uh, really running towards our Virginia Clean Economy Act targets to become carbon neutral. But um, we don't want to see us hit those emission targets at the expense of our commitments to the Bay Agreement. And as I mentioned in the presentation, Virginia is already going in the wrong direction when it comes to tree canopy. Um, this would be a, an, another aggregating factor that would make it even more difficult for us to sort of arrest that uh, unfortunate trend and get headed in a more positive direction. So we did participate in a work group that was produced as a result of that, that bill. Um, that work group wrapped up about two months ago and we are now waiting on um, the, the follow-up from the Department of Environmental Quality where they will set out rules for how solar on these agricultural and forest lands can proceed. And um, perhaps most importantly, if they do decide to, to utilize um, these prime ag or forest lands, what is the uh, conservation remedy? And so I would say stay tuned for us in the next couple of months. I think this legislative session, members are inclined to, to allow the agency to finish its process and, and see where they land before they bring additional legislation. Um, but undoubtedly it, it's going to come up and it will come up next year as well. Uh, we have two questions relating to the tree bills. The first one asks whether there are provisions to empower local stakeholders to monitor and report on non-compliance of developers. I don't think we have a specific clause that um, empowers local stakeholders. I, I will say that the fun thing about laws is um, there you can always report on all of them if someone is, is not following the law. So. Um, there's no no prohibition, but I will say there's no um, language encouraging um, cit citizen uh, reporting. And the other question asks, uh, is the tree canopy legislation going to counter the Dillon rule? Our community loses more mature canopy on privately held lots by homeowners decisions than we can replace with tree planting initiatives. Yeah, um, it, it won't counter the Dillon rule, but the legislation, you know, we have legislation that is specific to Northern Virginia, legislation that is specific to the whole state. Um, all of these are, all of these bills are needed because of the Dillon rule. Um, and so what each piece would do is um, come at a, a different aspect, either um, allowing localities to increase the amount of canopy within um, certain um, areas, uh, zoning areas um, that they're allowed to require, or um, as in legislation from Senator Suhas and Delegate Sullivan, um, allow the locality to review a site plan of, um, and then make recommendations around those mature trees. And, you know, it, it always feels silly to kind of say this, but really that's what these bills are, is the General Assembly giving localities permission to do the thing they want to do, which is protect their trees. Um, and that, um, so it doesn't get around it. It just, ex it, these pieces of legislation would just expand localities expressed ability. Thanks, Jay. And we have two questions about the Menhaden bill. Um, one asked if there are any specific updates on HB 19, and the other asked whether we're expecting resistance to the Menhaden funding bill. Why was it not included in the governor's budget? Well, I'll go backwards. Um, I don't know why it wasn't included in the governor's budget. I, I would have put many things in the governor's budget if I had my druthers that were not included. Um, the, in terms of opposition or pushback, I, this bill last year was negotiated in conjunction with industry. So we don't expect them to come against the, the study. Um, that being said, 
their Manhattan has never once moved through a committee easily. So um, don't quote me on that. I, I think if I were to point to the area that the folks can be most helpful, it's going to be on making sure that the funding remains in place. The, the legislation that Delegate Ware is carrying that includes the study, I suspect that will move relatively easy. But um, as I said at the top of the, of the meeting, the budget, it's where the rubber meets the road. So if we pass that bill and it's not included in the budget, which goes through a much um, more secretive process, then the study will not move forward. So I would encourage folks to reach out to members of the Appropriations Committee to make sure they know that you would like to see um, the Manhattan Study Bill fully funded this session. There are currently no other, oh, I said that too fast. Has CBF developed a position regarding the proliferation of data centers, especially in Loudoun and Prince William counties? I believe that my power is back. Um, I think that we're having some technical difficulties that our uh, office downtown, yes, I just got a confirmation, our power and, um, and internet went out in the Virginia CBF office, unfortunately. So we have lost Jay. Uh, as far as the question about whether CBF has developed a position regarding uh, data centers, especially in Loudoun and Prince William counties. I don't believe that we currently have a position at this time on that issue. Um, we also had somebody who said that students currently are in this webinar. Do we have any specific bills we would encourage them to explore? Uh, I always encourage students to explore bills based on their particular interests. So if they're passionate about trees, there are plenty of opportunities for them to advocate on those issues. Um, there's also the environmental literacy and education funding, which is a really great opportunity for students to go to their legislators and talk about how those experiences have impacted them. Those personal stories can make a really big difference in legislators um, hearing and remembering your meetings. So I would encourage them to look at what specifically they're interested in and then that education funding as well. And I don't believe we have any other questions at this time. Uh, I see one last question that was submitted. Um, is there any legislation regarding the Chesapeake Bay cleanup goals and or agricultural best management practices? Anne, are you still online to answer that question? Sure, Gabby. Um, the answer is yes. We, uh, Charlie went at the very start, uh, Jay talked about the budget and the fact that we're really grateful that the governor did put in a tremendous amount of money for agricultural best management practices. Fortunately, we have not seen a bill yet this year that um, pushes back the date by which um, you know, farmers have to have their cows fenced out of the stream and they have to have a nutrient management plan. So we're hoping that we're going to be able to hold steady on that date and 
if that's not the gist of your question, then you can, you know, you're welcome to either come off mute and ask it, or you're welcome to type a revised version. Charlie says that covers it. And I'll leave things open for just one more minute to see if there's any additional questions. Bob, I see uh, as of as all these bills get discussed, will CBF reach a point where you have a final list of bills CBF officially endorses, or do we just express support for general general concepts? Uh, we do have um, our bills that will be able to say that we officially endorse. Uh, our partners at Virginia Conservation Network also have a list of bills that they endorse um, that the broader environmental community has agreed to support. So we support many of those, not always overlapping, um, and we will be able to provide more uh, details to you in the next week or so as bill numbers all get listed out on exactly which bills will support um, and then, of course, things can flex throughout the session that the language might change. Um, so something that we might initially have some issues with at the beginning of session could go through changes and we can later support bills um, down the line as well. And I'm just scrolling through the other questions that are coming in. Um, Steve's question asks, what process will we have for Virginia to get back into Reggie? Uh, that process is currently relying, I believe, on the budget, correct me if I'm wrong, and for us to be able to get things back on track. Um, at the moment, there are lawsuits going on uh, regarding Reggie and the withdrawal. And the current status of that is that our um, partners who are working on those lawsuits are attempting to get the court to have a stay and hoping for um, funds to be distributed. And uh, that would happen, I believe, this month might be the next, um, the next dispersal of money. But the process is going to be a long road ahead for Virginia to try and get back into Reggie since we're currently in the process of pulling out of it. Uh, Eric, I see your question about the specifics of environmental justice bills that will be submitted. Um, I don't have a good answer to that. And can you answer that? Um, I don't have the bill number in front of me, but I'll say Shelly Simons introduced one bill that will look at harmful environmental impacts. And um, what I'll do is I'll just look it up real quick and then I'll, I'll put the bill link to the, in the chat. But that's one that I know CBF will, um, will definitely endorse. And I think the final question we have here is, do you have any specifics on the bills mentioned to roll back the current law re requiring living shorelines? Gabby, um, I, I'll just say this is Anne. I haven't, I haven't seen a bill that rolls back the requirements for living shorelines. Um, I maybe I'm missing it. If somebody is seeing such a bill, it, has, it we haven't seen it on our bill tracker yet. And John, I see that your hand is raised, so I'm going to unmute you. And you can go ahead and unmute to ask your question.
Are you there, John? Maybe we're not the only ones experiencing technical difficulties tonight. Since it looks like uh, we're having some issues, I don't see any other questions right now. So thank you everyone so much for your time this evening. I really appreciate you being able to join us. Jay says he's very sorry that he lost power and wasn't able to finish out the evening with us. Um, once again, I'd like to really encourage you to consider joining us on Water Lobby Day on January 30th here in Richmond. Uh, registration and additional details are in the chat. It's a really great experience and we'd love to have you. So thank you so much, everybody, and have a great evening.